Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Anna Contadini, and I'm so glad that we have managed to start the Research Seminar in Islamic Art, or RESIA, again after the pause caused by the difficulties encountered because of the pandemic. And thank you all again for your requests for the seminar to resume. I'm very pleased to have so many of you here tonight. We have moved the, um, the seminars to the Zoom platform, but I hope that we'll be able to meet in person again soon. Um, we have a series of three exciting seminars this term. Uh, you should all have received the program, but if not, please email me or, or Tanya. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce you to a remarkable artist whose uh, artistic techniques and thought processes are very interesting and actually they're very moving. And it's Sohela Sohanvari, uh, an Iranian British artist who moved to this country when she was a teenager. She graduated in biochemistry and worked as a research scientist for Cambridge University, which has given her the basis for a deep understanding of the materials she uses in art. Um, in 2005, she graduated again, uh, this time with an art history and fine art degree from Anglia uh, Ruskin University in Cambridge. And then she went on to gain a postgraduate diploma in fine art from Chelsea College of Art and Design in 2006, and then an MA in fine art from Goldsmiths College in 2011. So Hela has exhibited nationally and internationally, and her work is in private and public collections, including the Saatchi uh, collection, LACMA, the New Art Gallery in Walsall and the National Gallery of Victoria, Melbourne. And she's currently working towards a solo show at the Barbican here in London for next year. As you will see, her work deals with memory, trauma, displacement, biographies, approached in a very personal and emotive way and set against the social and social historical background of both pre and post revolutionary Iran. She's also a very interesting artist for the materials that she uses, as we'll see. Um, so Hela has kindly agreed to answer questions. Uh, do write them in the chat during or soon after her talk, and I will collect them and read them out at the end of the seminar. Well, so Hela, welcome. And over to you. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you, Katie and Matt and the entire SOAS team. It's an honor to be invited to talk about my art today. And thank you, each one of you, for the time and for your interest in my art. So first of all, welcome to my studio. My studio is at Wising Art Center. That's spelled W-Y-S-I-N-G. That's outside Cambridge. And um, so let me just give you a tour around my studio. I'm actually sitting at my Ectempa station. This is my pigments work, workstation. This is all pigments I've bought from um, uh, an apothecary which is um, placed in um, Venice near the Academia Bridge. I'm sure you can uh, find this. It's a very beautiful shop. And, uh, and then this is my um, work process. Um, I have some egg here which is the medium for my pigments, my brushes, which are kind of very tiny. I don't know if you can see that. My, I don't know, can you see that brush? It's very tiny brushes but for miniature paintings. And basically it involves um, getting my pigments, grinding them using a muller and a uh, glass slab. So you get, like in, in exactly like the medieval period, but you actually have to grind your own pigment to a flowery consistency. And then I apply that paint onto my um, support, which is a vellum. Now vellum comes in various um, uh, vellum sources from various sources. They can either be from sheep, 
uh, goat or calf, and I use I use calf bellum in my work. Um, and I actually come in as parchment or as cow scot. So this is parchment. You can see it's very close up. Can you see the the hair follicle? And you can see the dots on the on the um, on the vellum. Anna, can you see this? Um, the um, the dots that are um, from yeah, the see uh, something. Yeah. Okay. So they actually have been a little dots on the on the vellum that actually represents the hair follicles that happens on the skin of the calf, and. Um, this is usually used for paper as it's, it has a paper consistency, but it's much stronger than paper and it's used for um, book illustration or for, for illuminated manuscripts. It's actually used for calligraphy and watercolor and stuff like that. But what I use is actually Kelmscott, which is slightly uh, stronger and it has a cardboard consistency. And it's, uh, I think vellum is like, imagine what, um, the skin that's pulled over a drum is like. So it's actually the same material, but treated slightly differently. So this canvas got it's actually got a coating on it, which allows me to make my paintings directly on, on vellum without having to put gesso on it. And as I showed you, the, the brushes are actually very tiny. So let me just show you the brushes again. This is the brush. And uh, so um, I have to show you my crude oil station, which is on the different side of the room. Um, this is my crude oil station. And uh, crude oil is actually the material that um, I work with. And it's just the black stuff that comes out of the ground in Iran and Iraq. And it's not an art material. And I basically diluted with turpentine in various wells. And yet drawings, which I do on paper, and the drawings actually start with the the most dilute form of the um, crude oil, and I build up the color using, um, as, I, as I kind of build up the color using the more um, 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 concentrated form of the crude oil. And then this is like my um, uh, station where I kind of do my, uh, let my crude oil to dry. And then I kind of, um, this is also the station that I do my geometric pattern because it's my architect's table. So um, as Anna said, my interest um, is in um, political art and um, my, the theme of my work is to do with the, uh, I'm interested in the collective trauma and the shared narratives that are told through the, the, the individual story. And I kind of add bizarre and humorous um, text and, and uh, um, elements to my, 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 my work. So to continue with the theme of the uh, collective trauma, I was um, first of all interested in the idea of portraiture because I was interested in how I can tell the individual stories through portraiture. So the first um, interest came to me from 2005 when a friend of mine in Germany gave me this revolting, absolutely horrible um, document, which I, I'm really sorry that I'm showing it to you, but it's the first thing I had in 2005 so I'm going to have to share it with you. This is a Nazi SS member's passport that he found in the attic in his, in his house. And you can see, I, I'm really sorry, I really find it quite revolting to show this, this image. But anyway, you can see how this clown here, you can tell his political affiliation by the portrait that he has. It's actually a genuine passport, so you can see everything. And I was interested in, in portraiture as far as a passport is concerned because as a passport contains the identity, the personal identity that goes with the, um, with the photograph of the individual. And the, therefore you have the information about the person's age, the job, the height, and in fact the nationality. And for me the nationality was actually kind of um, the um, the way the trauma is actually contained in the nationality. As you can imagine, um, if you have, um, if you present a passport, which is um, um, uh, Islamic, like um, Iranian or Iraqi or uh, Syrian or uh, Afghani passport, at a border, you have a different trauma, uh, which kind of speaks about the, the political um, landscape today of the refugee crisis versus the ease of the passport shown 
um, by a British or an American or, or Western um, uh, individual holding a passport at a, at a border. So I kind of wanted to talk about trauma versus uh, the, um, you know, the collective trauma of the nationality through the story of the individual. Uh, can I have the first image, please? The passport in front of you shows the um, uh, a passport, which is, which is a British passport that was given to me by a friend. And um, I was interested in creating um, a, a, a political art uh, using these uh, passports. And for me, I was um, I decided to kind of create the stamp. I mean, it's the stamp that officiated the. Uh, the visa, the, the passport in the first place, I issued the passport in the first place. And I decided to change the, the text that was in the uh, stamp with the uh, text from um, 1960s, 1950s and 1970s British and American um, um, advertising slogans. Because of that era, the, the, the slogans that come from adverts are quite bonkers actually, they're quite funny. They're racist and they're kind of sexist and they kind of, um, they have this, um, um, funny words that, uh, as you can see, this is a mini, uh, the, the image on the right hand side is an uh, advertisement from a mini uh, car which was um, advertised in 1960s, late 1960s, and you can see that the wording is actually repeated in the stamp, in the um, uh, you don't need to have a big one to be happy. And I was interested in the, in the uh, wording that I use in each stamp for per nationality and uh, there's a relationship between the, the wording that's used and the, and the nationality of the holder, because here, for example, um, the British are very well known for the um, sort of innuendos and the puns, the flavor of the humor. So therefore this is uh, kind of um, has this um, uh, wording that is um, very much about the British and the humor. Next, next image, please. This one uh, is actually, uh, only dream to make you more interesting, is actually present in this stamp as well. Next one, please. The, the, the left hand side shows a Saudi woman, a parcel from a Saudi woman, and in the stamp it says, uh, reveal your inner goddess. That's, that's text from a, and I think an Avon, an Avon advert from 1970s. And on the right hand side, it says, just for men won't let you down. Again, another Saudi passport. And the text comes from just for men, which is a hair product for men. And, um, and next image, please. And this passport gets collaged at six passport per, per frame. And um, you get um, the, the passport gets sandwiched between two planes of glass so that the viewers can actually be aware of the holder's image as well as the, the genuineness of the passport from the cover. So you can be aware of both sides. Next image, please. My, my interest in making political art and as I was studying at Goldsmith, because Goldsmith is very kind of known for his um, conceptual art teachings. And I decided to, um, before I started at Goldsmith, uh, I decided to um, investigate the idea of making non-didactic political work. And um, in, in summer of 2009, I managed to get a hold of a 500 mil container of crude oil from this refinery, which is outside my city in Shiraz. I come from the city of Shiraz and uh, this, this refinery has been um, part of my childhood every time I pass by in the car, I was uh, impressed by the structure which is, shines in the, in, the, in the sunset or in the sun uh, in, uh, during the dawn. And um, it uh, kind of has a structure, a color, a smell and a noise which takes me back to my childhood. But it actually tells a story um, about the materiality being in the medium, the message being in the mater materiality of the medium. The message being in the material to the medium. So basically this material, which is a black stuff that comes out of the ground, that makes petrol and it makes um, diesel and it makes paint and it makes all this stuff that is um, not uh, actually an art material. It, it contains the history of Iran, Iran, Iran in it. So the medium actually contains the history of, um, you know, the discovery of oil from 1908 by the British. It contains the um, the nationalization of oil 
1951 by Mohammed Mossadegh involves, it contains the, the 1953 coup of um, uh, operated by CIA and Britain against the democratically elected government of Mossadegh and they removed him and they installed the Shah. And then obviously the, the, the revolution happened and everything that uh, is involved with the Kurdish in Iran. And in fact, the, the story is actually universal because we are all implicated in the consumption of Kurdish because Kurdish has environmental, economic, social, political elements that has both human cost and it has environmental cost. So it actually implica implicates us all in its use. Next image, please. So what I started to do at Goldsmith, I started joining using uh, Kudol and I decided to, to test it using various um, dilution um, mediums to actually dilute it with. And I settled on turpentine. And uh, so I started to draw my family photographs and they all, I always present my, my drawings as a grid. So this is a, a grid called um, Paradise Lost titled after the John Milton's epic poetry published in 1667. And the Paradise Lost is, contains um, family photographs. And then please keep an eye for these abstract shapes, which I kind of um, interspaced in my paint, in my grid. So I, I'll, I'll explain to you why they're there. Anyway, they kind of uh, come from um, all family photographs and uh, they kind of come from a dilution of Kudol with uh, turpentine. Next image, please. And this is the central image from Paradise Lost. It's actually called Paradise Lost. And it's uh, based on a family photograph of, um, I think it's from 1960s. Anyway, the idea is like when I, when I start drawing my, my, my um, um, drawings using Kudo, I draw from an original uh, photograph. Then I put that photograph away and I draw from that drawing. And then I put that drawing away and I draw from that drawing and so on until the image becomes pixelated and it becomes abstraction and becomes like a um, abstracted form of or, or pixelated form of the original image. And um, in, in this process, um, any spills, any happy accidents, any um, drops on my brush, any kind of blotches, any lack of information, any loss of information gets incorporated in the next drawing. Therefore, for me, this process becomes like um, metaphor for memory because as you kind of remember, you don't remember anything as precisely as you know we would like. You always have some lack of memory and you have some addition to memory. So I think the the process actually mimics the idea of the or, or is metaphor for the idea of memory, as memory falls in and out of the lens of um, um, you know and falls in and out of, of focus. Uh, next image, please. And this image is called the Sin Eaters. And I just wanted to show you how the size of these, um, these drawings were actually on an A4 camphor paper. And you can see how the bleed of the kudal actually goes beyond, beyond the, the tape. I put a tape around the, the image uh, using this tape. And I kind of um, occasionally the, the kudal actually seeps beyond it. And I quite like the halo. Next. This is called uh, Full Moon in My Pocket. This is uh, an image of my mother, myself, and my sister. And I just want to show you how the different um, um, treatments of the drawings are. Uh, next image. And in this um, um, grid, there are images that, apart from family photographs, there are images based on media, images from the era. So you can see um, this is on the left hand side, there's an image of myself and my father and my father's friend uh, around the time of the revolution. And um, this is collaged uh, from uh, two photographs, which are basically from the 1979 overthrow of the Shah. You can see how the Shah's statue is pulled down. Imagine how um, Saddam Hussein's uh, sculpture was, uh, or statue was pulled down. So these kind of images that repeat in history, um, they kind of have this um, relationship between my family and uh, you know, um, um, and the event of the, the time. And the image on the right hand side is actually um, the death of Benno Ahnesorg. Benno Ahnesorg was a 26 year old German um, a student 
who um, was uh, killed in 1967 by the German police as he was demonstrating against the uh, state visit of the Shah of Iran. And um, so the Shah was visiting West Berlin in 1967 on the 2nd of June, and uh, he was um, on his way there. There were some anti-Shah and pro-Shah demonstrations, and the, the crowd got violent, and it got out of hand, and the police overreacted to their violence, and Penel got shot in the back of the head. And I in included that in the image in my group because I was interested in how um, events in one country can have repercussions in another country. And uh, I was just trying to say that we are all connected through this politics. And just like COVID, we are actually kind of aware of how interconnected humanity really is. Next image, please. And these are the abstract shapes I was telling you earlier. These are actually conceptual based on the idea of the, my, my being an exile. So um, I, I call it, the, I sing the body electric, which is titled after the Walt Whitman poetry, but they are considered to be self-portraits. And it's self-portraits because since I left Iran in 1978, I haven't lived in Iran. I have not been living with my family since I was a teenager. So I was um, thinking about how I can represent the absence. How can I represent my, uh, my being absent or being exiled from Iran? So I decided to draw the negative spaces between people in, in family album, in photographs that were taken post-1979 revolution. And I draw the negative spaces between people as my self-portrait. That's where I should have been. Therefore, they are my, um, you know, they are me. So if you imagine on the left-hand side, you can see this figure is actually has a, a space which has got a forehead, there's a nose, there's a mouth, there's a chin, there's a shoulder, and there's a shoulder of a baby, and a chin, and a cheek and a forehead of a baby, and then this is a lamp which hangs in the middle of the room. So I think you can understand how uh, this, um, this um, uh, shapes actually function. This is an, on the right hand side, this is an image from between somebody's legs. This is um, uh, the edge of the trousers, the bottom of the, the top of the boots, and then again, the edge of the trousers and the space between their legs. And this um, material is a, as 22 karat gold, and I buy my, my gold as a um, loose gold from Cornelison's. And the reason I, I use this gold and crude oil in this drawing is because I was interested in how they are both the um, most precious commodities in the world, and uh, they're both back US dollar. And I was interested in how, um, you know, in my uh, this is the reason why we are having political turbulence. We have recession because of these two materials. And this is why I'm an exile in my country. Oh, sorry, an exile outside my country. Next image, please. So in my, in my art, I'm interested in the era of 1925 until 1979. This is the, the Pahlavi regime era. And uh, so before the um, Pahlavi regime, um, um, came into power, Iranian women were dressed like the image on the left-hand side. This is how women had to dress um, in public space. And um, they had to wear a full yak neshmak with a burqa and a, and a, and a uh, veil. And they had to walk on the left-hand side of the road. And if they wanted to speak, they had to put their half finger in their mouth and had to talk like that to a, a man that they're not married to, they're not related to. And this is all told to me by my, by my grandmother. So I have first, um, first hand experience of this, um, so second hand experience of this. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, interested in how in 1935, Reza Shah, which is this, this figure here, he went to uh, Turkey, met Ataturk, and was inspired by his modernization in Turkey. And he was um, Ataturk, as you know, he kind of modernized Turkey by unveiling women, he changed the alphabet and he um, industrialized Turkey. So when, um, when Azasha came back from uh, Turkey, um, he, he had taken over the, the Qajar dynasty in 1925. So almost nine years later, in 1936, he decided to unveil women of Iran, but he decided to unveil them by force without any consent. So the women were forced to wear hats and dresses. And also the men were um, 
uh, ordered to wear um, Western um, outfits, so the Western suit. And so it's very much like what Peter the Great did to Russia. And um, I, I was interested in how these two men who actually forced their people to actually change were interested in modernizing their country. They wanted to show their people as less as othering, as less as less and um, less than their othering, and to kind of bring them to the same level as the Western people. And um, you know, my grandmother said to me, um, "This, this actually, this event actually." The forcing or unveiling of women in Iran uh, actually split the country into two factions, to two, two camps. There were the, the, the conservative people who actually remained very angry at the Pahlavi regime for, for you know, following the Western um, um, aesthetically fashion and, and ideologies. And the other side, which actually embraced the, the liberal the emancipation and the liberalization of women, because Reza Shah actually opened schools for girls and uh, his son actually allowed women to vote. But my grandmother, but my, both my grandmothers came from different teams. So one of my grandmothers said to me, I embraced the uh, unveiling, I loved it. I, my, my mother was um, allowed to go to school. She went to university, I actually got educated. But my other grandmother, my father's grandmother, she never embraced the, the, um, the, the um, unveiling. And she said it was like, as if a government has asked me to wear a bikini. And then if you don't wear it, then you get arrested. So it was like this kind of um, splitting, which is like, as if, you know, in our, uh, exactly how Brexit actually split the, the, the British country. Uh, I feel like this was like the instigator for splitting Ura Iranian into two different factions. Next, please. So for my, for my um, paintings, I was interested in kind of um, uh, bringing all this um, physical stuff into my art. And uh, I thought, how can I do this? So I started to, first of all, my first paintings were involving the kudo as a flesh color. So this is all done in kudo on vellum. And the, um, the patterns behind there are done in malachite and lapis lazuli, and there's gold in there, and there's um, egg tempera on vellum. And um, the idea, the philosophy behind the patterning in Islamic art, as you know, is about um, sort of there's, there's a never, the patterns are never innocent. So the pattern has a meaning. And this pattern of stars and, and geometric patterns and arabesque pattern meant to show the infinity of God and vastness of universe. So, um, you know, it's meant to represent the idea of galaxies and stars and, and you know, the fact that this, this pattern can go on for eternity. So that sort of represents the vastness of um, universe and greatness of God. And also, I wanted to talk about delirium. So the idea that Islamic uh, architecture, particularly mosques or any other Islamic um, uh, building, where it has um, over-decoration, everything, everything inside is decorated, is um, partly because the idea is like, as a viewer enters the space, you become, you enter a state of delirium so that you lose a sense of yourself and start contemplating God. So I decided to adopt this philosophy for my art. And for my, um, so as, a, as if you enter my paintings, you can actually start going a bit dizzy because the patterns actually are um, everywhere. And I kind of use this idea of halos that are um, involved in the um, medieval and iconic paintings of Western, and to incorporate it, to incorporate it in my paintings. But anyway, this um, next next image, please. And as I said, um, my paintings originally started with my my family photographs. This is my father. I did not just focus on women's painting. This is this image is actually this size. My paintings are about very the the very miniature actually. So um, they kind of um, uh, have. Um, 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 the, ma the maximum size I actually go to is, is um, this size. So my, my paintings actually start by doing a, um, a cartoon of the image. I do the cartoon of the image and then I, I uh, and that's how it's always done in two medieval eras where you had to do a cartoon of the image before you, you finish the, um, before you started the painting. And then you fill in the colors. This, this is something I'm doing for the Barbican show. So, um, and then you fill in the colors 
And then you kind of, um, in the medieval paintings, a lot of the uh, pre-paint under, undercoats were actually green or okra or, or um, brown, but because my paintings are from black and white photographs, they actually start with a gray background and I build up the color on top. And so, um, and for me, this, um, this um, uh, idea that men had to, um, um, this is Cowboy Ali, my father makes a rubbish cowboy actually. And I think I was interested in how men in Iran had to embrace the Western um, um, outfit. And for me, this is like taking it one more uh, step and my father has actually become a cowboy. And because Iran was looking at the West through the lens of Hollywood, and um, so uh, in my paintings, there are lots of symbols which I put in and I, and for example, the, the cacti, because they are a phallic, they represent the idea of patriarchy. And I always have a cacti which lots of needles, which is kind of, I'm just trying to say that patriarchy is actually painful for men and women. They actually hurt the entire culture. Next image, please. This is again my father in a painting called Khosra and Shirin. Khosra was a king. Um, it's a mythological story of uh, Iranian um, um, history. It's um, Khosra was a Persian king who fell in love with a Shirin, who was an Armenian princess. And he saw her secretly bathing. And he fell in love with her. And he married her. And um, his son, who fell in love also with his stepmother, he, he stabbed his father in the heart as he was lying next to his wife. So it's like a very tragic story, like a Romeo and Juliet story. But anyway, it's a, it's a mythological story. But here, for me, I think there's a relationship between the sitter and the, um, the background. So you can see in the, in the enlarged detail part, you can see that Shirin is actually giving uh, the Khosra a, a, um, a, um, a seductive look. And Khosra has just finished throwing flowers at her feet. So there's, a, there's an interaction between the, the foreground and the background. We're not sure what the reality and the fantasy is. And, and so I think um, it's, it's kind of uh, brings out the mythology of Iranian, Iranian um, stories, which have very much a political um, language to them. Next image, please. And just also to show you quickly that this, um, my early images actually included my family photographs as well. This is my mother, this is me in her stomach, she was pregnant with me, and this is my first self-portrait actually as a baby in her tummy. And this is my, um, this is a painting of me and my brother and my sister, and the reason it's quite a beautiful tragedy is because it's the, uh, from a, um, a, a, a photograph of my last holiday with my sister and brother before I came to England. And the uh, painting has been inspired by the Japanese woodcut and perhaps even Van Gogh's um, paintings. Next image, please. And um, this is called Dark Horse. The Dark Horse is um, basically uh, a, um, a um, painting which talks about feminism. And this is my mother sitting in a, in a perhaps a 1970s or 1960s background. As I said, I think um, a pattern for me is never innocent. Pattern actually is used for branding, so you can actually use it for placing a person in a in an era or in a, a social strata. So, for example, if you see a branding like a Gucci pattern, you can talk about a certain social uh, affordability, uh, economic affordability. And if you see a a golden, brown, and orange pattern from a 1970s council state carpet, then you can see how that kind of talks about that social strata. So for me, patterning is never innocent. It actually tells about the person and it places them in a, in a certain uh, era and it puts them in a certain social strata. So this is a, a woman in 1970s or 1960s, late 1960s, she don't, you, don't know, you don't know whether she's sitting in front of the horse or whether the horse is going out of her head, but um, the horse is actually rearing on his high, on, a, on her hind legs against the leopard, which is in the leopard, which is in the vegetation at the back. Against again the uh, uh, images from the patriarchy, and then on a the woman's side, the landscape is very flat. It's very green. There's a, a light to the horizon, and the male side there's this drier. Um, harsher, more sort of like a 
grander um, uh, landscape with, with harsh mountains that you have to climb and the sky is kind of very kind of plain. Um, next. And again, this is a, a painting which is called Another Birth. It's very tiny, it's about 10 by 13 centimeters. And it's basically my mother as a modern um, um, Virgin Mary painting. So she's sitting within a halo of um, uh, stars. These are all out of Malachite. And in her arms is me lying there. Uh, and the, in, in my body, there's an image of a um, bird's eye view of a landscape. That's because I, 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 I left Iran and I became um, an exile. So um, next image. This is a conquest of the garden. And as I kind of exhibit this, this uh, painting, I put in the bracket, Google the title, so that actually the, the, the work becomes partly um, performative by the viewer. So as you Google the title, the, the poem of Full of Files that comes up, and you can actually then read the poetry and become aware of the language I'm actually using to talk about feminism. In this courtyard, which is typical of town, Houses in Iran, which is a, 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 a paved courtyard with a border of plants. There's no plants in the garden except these fists that are growing in the, in the ground as flowers, and they are punching the air because they're protesting. And this pattern actually places the woman in a non-Western background. So you know that she's talking about a woman that is in a non-Western environment. She could be in, a, in any medieval, sorry, Middle Eastern background, but in a, um, in a kind of like a, a universally um, Middle Eastern or Islamic uh, background, which is, I think these kind of issues are very um, pertinent to all, all these uh, cultures. Next image, please. And again, this painting is uh, one that uh, you get uh, prompted to kind of uh, um, participate from the viewer. So on the left hand side, you see the image of my mother and myself. My mother is in positive and I'm painting in negative. And as, as you kind of take a um, uh, look at the title, it tells you to um, take a photograph of the image and then use an app to invert the image. And then you can see me in positive and my mom becomes negative. And that's because I was split up from my mother from an early age and this, we can never uh, um, exist in the same universe and we actually exist in parallel universes. Next image. And again, this is, uh, again, the idea of the, um, um, uh, halos and the, you know, again, the stars and the cosmos and the idea that this um, is actually representing the vastness of universe and greatness of God. And um, you can see my mother and my auntie, the both are actually both pregnant I did for this photograph. And uh, uh, I decided to put myself and my cousin in the painting. And you can see that both my um, both our umbilical cords are connected to the flower pattern that goes over the dress. And um, my auntie is actually offering the extension of the, uh, the pattern to my mother who's touching the leaf. And it's called Children of the Revolution because all the children that were born in 1960s and 1970s, they ended up either being sent away from the country uh, as exiles or they, they had to like the film from um, by Marjan Satrapi, the um, Persepolis, which tells the story of not just by Marjan, but was the story of all of us who were sent away from Iran, and it tells the story of all the children that grew up and they had to fight the Iran Iraq War in nineteen eighties. So I think this this is a, the, the the generation that were really affected by the revolution. And just to say that. The reason I paint on vellum is that I kind of um, I want to um, um, I paint on calf vellum because calf is the sacrificial animal that is used used in most monotheistic religions, and for me it represents the sacrifice of the individual. Next, please. And this one is actually basically. Um, for my show at the Barbican next year. Um, it started in 2018 and 2019. I was, uh, 2018, I was at the British School at Rome and I, I was watching, binge watching Fellini films. And then I decided that I wondered what happened to our 
our film stars and our, our actors and our actresses. And um, I decided to paint um, the, the portraits. And I found out that after the revolution, not only were the women were forced to wear the veil and not wear Islamic hijab, and not only were they um, sort of forced to actually um, behave in a in a back you know in a, in a certain way, but um, uh, the the one thing that were um, uh, universally happened to all actors and all um, female male actors as well as writers, singers, dancers, they were all arrested, taken to Evin prison, and they were forced to sign a Toba letter. Toba means repentance letter, repenting their sins for whatever act or whatever um, platform of art they were occupying. And in that, um, a lot of them, a lot of them, but not all of them, were banned from ever uh, appearing in, the, in that platform. And uh, a lot of them actually had to kind of um, um, start um, emigrating or they had to live in anonymity. And this is a um, the portrait of a um, uh, Qomar, um, Qomar who um, was the first woman singer who in 1924 sang without a veil in public. And here you can see this um, uh, idea of magic realism. So magic realism for me, it's actually kind of um, important because I was interested in the idea that um, um, magic realism allows um, an artist or a writer to speak about unspeakable truths, to criticize the culture without being pinned down, allowing us to have a wiggle room for the meaning. And it actually allows us to give multiple meaning to a painting. I never explain my art, so I always need my paintings I don't fully explain my art, I should say. And I always leave my, my paintings open to the viewers to unpack. So, uh, for example, here these flowers are, you know, either they're in a vase or they actually are the flowers that have been thrown at her feet because she was a singer. And uh, she, you know, you, after a performance, she actually there's flowers that are thrown at you. But in, in the detail, you can see how this, um, uh, there's a, um, 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 an angel, a Persian miniature angel, who's offering a flower to the to the um, to the singer. So that's like um, sort of paying homage to her brilliance and her fantastic singing. And of, of course, she died in 1956, which is before the revolution. But even then, the, the conservatives allowed this allowed her body to be buried next to her family. She came from a very religious family. They all got buried in a mosque, but she was this allowed to have her body buried in a mosque because she was a singer. Next image, please. This is Gurush. Gurush is an international singer, pop star. She's an actor. She's a fashion icon. And here, the magic realism shows itself in the detail. So you can see the the, 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 the painting behind the sitter is actually in flesh color, and she, the, 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 the sitter is actually painted in, in gray. So you're not sure who's the reality, who's actually occupying the real space. And these patterns actually have double meaning. They actually, uh, for me, represent the flames. So they kind of can be either she's a hot stuff, like the, the icon of flame, or they can show the flames of hell. But um, this this pattern on the floor in Islam in Islamic art that actually represents the cosmos. So I wanted to show that the universe is at her feet. Next, this is Jamila, which is um, a, a painting called the Dancing Queen. She was a dancer, international dancer. She danced for um, Aristotle Onassis. She danced for Henry Kissinger. She was the most famous Iranian uh, dancer, international. Middle Eastern. I mean, she was just like the highest paid dancer that we had in Iran. And she was, after the revolution, she was, um, had her properties um, confiscated and she was banned from um, dancing. And like Google, she moved to LA and now that's where she lives and dances for the, um, she danced for the um, expats, expats there. Next. This is Furusan after the title is called Hey Baby, I'm a Star. She's actually sitting in a bedroom scene. That's because um, Furzan was a top actress. She had, um, um, after the revolution, she was arrested and all her properties, including her house, her bank account was frozen and all her films were burned. 
And that's because she actually appeared in some very soft sexual films where she actually kissed a man on a bed. I mean, it was just that, that sort of to date. And um, she, she had to uh, basically live in an anonymity and she died in, 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 on, on, on alone. And uh, I, I think that's very important to actually um, tell her story because she was like um, Marilyn Monroe, for example. She, she was that big in Iran. She was a top star. Next. This is um, Toba. Toba means a repentance, as I said, and it's a portrait of Zahra Khoshkham. And Khoshkham was an uh, actress, actor, I should say, sorry. And she was um, the only person who was one of the very few people who was um, considered chaste enough during the uh, film Farsi era, which is like pre-revolutionary era, where she was actually allowed to continue with her acting career. So the story has to include some of these women that were allowed to continue to, to perform. Next image, please. Again, this, this image is quite small. This is called The Woman in the Mirror, Farishta Janabi. Farishta Janabi was an actor from 1971 until 1978. And her acting involved her to do some sexual scenes in, in some films. And um, I think she did nine or 10 films. And in this, she actually appeared almost nude and she did some sex scenes. For this, as well as losing everything, as well as her properties, her, her money, her everything she ever earned, she actually uh, had a death um, um, a sentence that was um, um, decreed unto her. And she, uh, this, she skipped bail and she lived for the next 20 years in uh, hiding and she got addicted to drugs and dr died of drug overdose at the age of 50. So basically, I wanted to tell the stories of these women because many of these women came from poor and conservative backgrounds where they had to be abandoned by the family or they, they were just like um, either been abandoned by them or they, they had to abandon, abandon them in order to continue with their platform and for their arts. And, um, in order to achieve a national and international status. They were partly responsible through their brave and courageous acts and the passion for their arts to become pioneers for liberation and sexual emancipation of Iranian women. They were walking a tightrope of the cultural divide that allowed Iranian women to gain so much in a very short space of time in a generation. I feel it's most important to put their stories for the world to see. Frida Kahlo once said, as she was asked why she paints flowers and she said it's because she doesn't want them to die. And this is the reason I want to paint these women because I don't want them to die. I don't want them to die in anonymity. I don't want them to die in, in um, a, a lonely death. And I want to give them a platform back. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Sohaila. This was really fascinating. Um, talk and so emotional and also uh, you know you conveyed all the layers it's, it's like a stra stratigraphy of meaning yeah. and work and uh, connections with uh, with the social historical um, uh, situations but also questions of memories of biographies yeah. and yeah very very interesting um i i hope that uh please put some questions or points uh, to 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 sahela and while um people are doing that i wanted to ask you whether you could i was very uh, interested in this concept of magical reality and mm -hmm. whether you can say a little bit more about that so magical realism is actually a, a happens in countries where there's censorship by the government. So whether it's like South American countries or whether it's like Iran or basically allows the artists or the writers is actually much more uh, prominent amongst writers. So it allows the writers and the artists to actually talk about social criticism and uh, to, to be critical of the um, realities of their living without being pinned down and without having the meaning that is kind of very obvious. So it allows to create a multi-narrative layer 
work that is open to the viewer to, to unpack and to kind of do over their own conclusion and actually allows them to actually criticize a, a culture which they can't, it allows them to have a wiggle room so they can't be pinned down as it were. So I use that magic realism because my, my, my work is very kind of layered. And it allows, magic realism actually allows the, the different meanings to actually exist at the same time. Thank you very much. There are some uh, comments in the chat. So Ilaria Gianfranceschi says, thank you so much. It was very touching. Thank you for sharing these stories. And Hamid Kashmir Shekhan has some questions. Thanks for your presentation. Unfortunately, I missed the first part of the talk and so I might have missed this part. As most of your works actually depict different autobiographical stories, I wonder how you would locate your work in the last series in particular within Orientalist and exotic context, namely how you see would meet the pre-existing expectation as an Iranian British artist. How would you try to avoid self-othering proce uh, process and being gazed through those reductive readings of your work? I think, thank you so much for your question. Um, it's very interesting, actually. I think the othering is something that you cannot help. And as an artist, I think one is constantly asked about, you know, first thing that the people said to me is, how do you feel like about being a woman British artist, you know, like or Iranian, Iranian woman artist? And I'm thinking, you never asked that from Luke Toyman. So why'd you ask me? You know, it's like, why didn't you ask a man? Or how does it feel about being a Belgian artist, about being a Belgian male artist? You never asked that from them. So I think othering is like something that's loaded on us and that's something we can't help. And I can't ever shed my national nationality skin. But as far as how do I see my work in the context of Iranian, um, um, sorry, what was the question again? Was it like? So, so yes. So how would you lay, locate your work yes. within Orientalism in a certain context? Yeah. And, and how would you yeah. sort of uh, go against uh, self-othering yourself? you know, being gazed through those reductive readings of your work. Like, like I said, I can't have the reductive reductivity of people's gaze on, on me and I can't escape that. But I, I feel like it's important to kind of put my art as a within the context of um, illuminated manuscripts and about how uh, my, my, my work actually continues with the same um, in Persian miniatures actually you know, it contains the same principles and disciplines that have been universally used in the Persian miniatures. So I think it's 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 kind of like um, um, it's basically um, speaks about the same um, um, principles that have been um, used by um, Reza Abbasi, for example, or uh, all the Gajar portraiture which has happened in the um, Fajr dynasty. Um, I think it's called Mir Amiri, I, I can't remember his first name, but my paintings actually can relate to the, to, to the traditional paintings of um, Persian miniatures, which I kind of bring to the modern by um, adding the um, Persian miniatures, mixing with um, language of the Western, um, um, depiction of uh, figurative and and I kind of mix it all together because I think I'm a collage of both Persian and British um, values and and experiences and histories. So I think my my painting actually spans both these um, sort of um, continents actually. So, so I think I could say you feel that you fit within a tradition. I feel within the tradition, but actually I've borrowed so much from the, the, the Western language that I think because of my, I think it's a very difficult question to answer actually, because I have to um, be honest and I have to say that my paintings are what they are. As an artist, you can't really analyze yourself so much because this is a, like your own, your own, um, it's like asking why do you write a certain way? You know, you, it's your handwriting. This is how you actually make your art. So. Uh, I'm trying to sort of put something into a sensible sentence so that I can make myself understood. I think 
it's, um, I am a collage of the cultures and my education is from uh, partly, mainly from Britain and partly from Iran because my technique comes from my father. My father told me, my father told me I had to attend for techniques. So I kind of learned everything from him, but I've added my language of the, um, whatever I've learned from goldsmiths and, you know, Chelsea and, and Anglo Ruskin. Of course, everyone is kind of like a, um, well, what is what Salman Rushdie said? Salman Rushdie said, in order to understand me, you have to sort of the you have to sort of the world. So I think to understand me, you have to sort of the world in, in a way. So I'm a I'm a collage of everything. Sorry if I didn't answer your question properly, but it's very difficult to answer that sort of question. And uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Then there is uh, uh, Sandra Luison who says, I'm a real fan of, of your work as Sohaila knows. And she says, I like your emphasis on the voiceless, placing the female subject as the main focal point is empowering, disrupts the, the narrative of patriarchy or any other form of control, particularly of the female body. Yes, absolutely. And because I think after the revolution, there's been, uh, I mean, I've, my focus is on Iranian women image because after the revolution, there's been a um, lack of image of women. And I think a lot of female artists that have been working on this, uh, Iranian artists actually focusing mainly on veil work. And I was interested in not representing women in a veil. I was interested in empowering women, and actually telling an alternative story of the women empowerment, the emancipation from the, you know, from the, you know, getting hold of their own sexual agency, you know, I was interested in kind of presenting an alternative image of Iranian women, that one that is not spoken about by other artists. So absolutely, Sandra, it's absolutely, yeah, this is my, my, um, my goal. Thank you for your points. And Kathy Shahande says, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Your work is very personal, as you mentioned, layered in meaning. When showing this work in an uninitiated viewer would not grasp many of your symbolism. Yeah. How do you address this, if at all? Well, I, I kind of address it in times like this, or actually I leave it to the viewer to unpack. There's often, there's a little text that goes in my paintings, you know, often in a catalog or in the form of a, um, you know, audio, audio um, explanation. But, you know, I think if, um, as an artist, I think it's very difficult to actually put so much of what you intend to people to see in your paintings, because like I said, as an artist, all you can do is make your art and it's up to people to unpack it. But of course, it, it helps to have text and, um, you know, um, to explain my paintings, but I don't expect people to understand as they come across my paintings. And it's always interesting to actually talk to people after they've seen my painting without realizing what my intentions were, because they actually tell me sometimes, oh, I saw this in it. And I'm thinking that's, that's actually a very valid point because, you know, just the fact that I, I have cacti as representing patriarchy, it doesn't mean that that's exactly how I want you to always read it. It could be that you want to see it as a, you know, this man in a, in a landscape, which is not even Iranian, it's like an American background, you know. so. I don't mind it, but I think it's always for most artists that use a um, language of magic realism, they need to have a little key or like a text that comes in the catalog that can kind of hint at various ways of um, using symbolism and metaphors that you can then unpack the paintings with. But that only comes with a catalog and comes with a book and comes with more information. Thank you. Um... If there are any other questions, so uh, yes, there is one from Roxana Zenghari. Thank you very much. Fascinating works and touching talk. I just, I'm just wondering about the choice of the geometric patterns, which are more from Morocco. Is that a visual decision or you consider a special concept for that? Well, um, it was a decision that I had to take because um, geometric patterns that were in Iran, they were kind of, um, I have actually used them a lot of the time, but there are some uh, patterns which are used by um, Iranians that are Moroccan. And I think there's this cross-cultural um, um, sharing of images and um, uh, patterns, which of course, 
they originate in one country, but they're used by many countries. And I can tell you some, some um, architecture in Shiraz, which uses Moroccan patterning. So the, 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 it doesn't mean that just because it's Moroccan, it's only used in Morocco. But of, of course, what I'm trying to say is like, this um, issues are actually very much to do with the universal uh, Middle Eastern issue for women and um, it's actually an Islamic women issue. So I um, use these patterns as I use Persian patterns and I use Islamic patterns as a whole to talk about these stories of Islamic women and specifically about Iranian women, but I'm actually talking about the bigger um, Islamic women and their um, you know, feminism and issues concerning them. Thank you for that question, that's excellent. Thank you. And uh, Simon O'Meara says, thank you for introducing for the first time to many of us tonight, myself included, your poignant work. Thank you. Count me as one of your most recent fans. Thank you so much. <laughs> My question is this, uh, where or what is your ideal environment for displaying your art? Oh, God, I was asking an artist to was like, uh, okay, so um, ideally, I think my art has to be in a museum and it has to be accessible to everyone. As I said, I have some of my work in, the, in museums and um, I, I feel like as an artist, I think that's the best place. So that's a public space. I don't, like whenever you sell a painting to a private collection, that's like in a way a worse thing because although the money is actually very welcome, but to have a painting in a private collection and actually having it locked away in somebody's house. So that's, that's the worst uh, uh, um, deal, but the best uh, deal is actually having it in a public place, in a, in a restaurant actually, or in, a, in any place where there's, there's people actually going to come and counter. And I feel like there's ought to be more art, more um, uh, art available to people, to children, even schools, you know, why not have, an exhibition space in any every, every school. Why not have uh, exhibition space in libraries and public spaces that people can actually um, enjoy, not only to look at, but to uh, understand another culture and another way of thinking. So yeah, I mean, any, any public place is good enough for me. Thank That's you. Good. Nice. Um, I have uh, another question, which is slightly connected with that. And, you know, I was quite uh, impressed when you uh, first, when we first talked, that your art is, is quite small, as you yes. say. And you know, when you look at it in, in on the picture on the slide, <laughs> it, it, it can look yes. big. But it puts size is down. <laughs> but, but you know, I think that it would uh, work quite well as, as also big, uh, you know, in terms of, I don't know, I mean, uh, the, the patterning, the colors, the very vibrant colors could probably work, you know, yeah. as a big piece of art as well. I, I was wondering what, what you think about that, whether you can explain a little bit more why you want this. Yeah. I know about the painting, but uh, yeah. This is the, biggest, the biggest drawing I've ever done is this big. So this is the size of my biggest drawing. And the reason miniatures are, are small is because Traditionally, they're meant to be book illustrations. They're like illuminated manuscripts. They're actually meant to contain a book. And they're related to the, to the miniatures that were done for the Elizabethan miniatures so that you can carry the, you can carry the person's photograph of, of painting with you as a, you know, like an icon for a, a worship or as a image to actually contain uh, with, your, with yourself so that you can actually look at it and enjoy. So the idea that miniatures actually um, are, are there as a, a valid kind of like, they have a history which goes back for many, many years, goes back to icon paintings and in fact before that. So um, um, very good question, but I feel like for me as a child, when I was a little girl, my father used to read me uh, Shahnameh which is a book of kings in Iran. And for me, I think I was interested in how the entire story could be told, like as if the entire world was contained in a smaller space. It's like, as if, because there was no, um, from, there was no perspective in these paintings, in major paintings, the, there was like, the, the, the figure would be repeated in, in the painting. And my father would point his finger to one figure and he said, this is, this is what's happening here and this is what's happening there. I was fascinated how, Tiny, tiny spaces, like, and and um, 
can tell so much stories about, um, um, uh, contain so much stories. And I was actually interested in how Thomas Apps, who's a German um, 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 abstract artist, she talks about how her abstract paintings, they have to fit her face. And I thought that's kind of like an interesting thing to say, to have a painting which fits your face, because I think anything more that would be lost, you know? And for me, I think the idea is like, because I'm a trained miniature painter, because I use a tempera, because the process is very slow, it would take me a year to finish a painting that would be a large painting. Whereas the painting for me takes six to eight weeks for a small painting, which is still very long time because I work very long hours. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an art nun or an art monk, I should say. I don't do anything except my art. So I feel like it would, it would be practical. And I, and I wonder whether it would lose its delicateness. You know, if it was bigger, then I think what I would tend to do if I'm making a bigger painting, I would make the, the, the pattern exactly the same size, but make the, the figures, you know, uh, make more figures. But the, the, the detail would still be the small because I feel like as you make the pattern bigger, I think you lose something in this, in the, in the, in the delicateness of the, of the paintings. But thank you for the question. Thank you. Any other question? I can't see anything more in the chat. Um, oh, Hamid uh, Kashmir Shekhan again. How would you relate your work to pop art and pop culture in general? Well, there's some paintings which I've done which are very pop artish, and you can see them in the Barbican. I, I hope that when you can come to Barbican, you see these paintings. My husband's leaving the room. Uh, so I think um, pop art is, um, um, well, I borrow a lot of things from a lot of um, um, various movements. I have uh, the, the Japanese woodcut in my paintings, I showed you, I borrowed from um, uh, Henri Rousseau in my mother's painting, I borrowed from um, um, Goya, I borrowed from, so pop art, I have some paintings which I, ha I haven't got access to right now, but if you come to see my, my show in Barbican, there are some pop artish um, paintings that are there. So I don't really like to classify my art as a specific type, because then I, sh I shut the door on all the other influences. So, um, of course, as a Western woman living in West, I'm actually inspired and uh, influenced by a lot of art. So, you know, um, I'm inspired by it. Yeah. I mean, I do use it. I have used it in my art, yeah. Thank you. And uh, Sandra Lewison says, the miniature scale is a more intimate encounter um going back to the previous point and Cathy uh, relating to the last point the notion of hybridity yeah yes and I think it's to do with um absolutely I think as I said I'm a collage of both cultures Persian and English and I feel like um I don't know where my English part starts and where my English my Iranian bit stops so it's kind of like it's like my handwriting and, and like when I look at the painting, the painting, when I look at an image, when I look at a photograph, the photograph animates in front of my eyes. So I don't, my imagination is like, uh, it's as if I'm not in control of what my imagination wants that painting to become, that image to become. So I don't really put that much process in the, in the idea of like how um, the language I'm going to use or what influence I'm going to use. The, the image comes to life for me as a, as a ready-made as you were. I just imagine you look at an image and the, the kind of comes to me. So I don't know where this comes from. I have no idea where my inspirations are from. I, just, so I think I'm probably crazy. You are a Renaissance artist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, possibly, I have no idea. That would be uh, a great um, uh, um, um, thing to be, but I feel like, um, I think the only thing I can say is like, I've, I've been possessed by an evil spirit that makes me want to make art. Not evil. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, are there any other comments? Otherwise, um, we can close here. I want to remind everybody to come. I think it's next Thursday, actually, the 2nd of December, 6 o'clock, for Natasha Morris from the Courtauld Institute. So please. 
join us also. So Hela, you join us. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the invite. Thank you today for everyone's time. And thank you, Anna and Kathy and Matt. Matt, yeah. everyone, for your help and for your input. For everybody. Thank you. And thank you so much, Sohela, for the most interesting talk. Thank you so much. A virtual applause. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for your time. Bye.